so welcome to Stowe Berkstack. I'm just going to give you a bit of a context to why we're doing this event, um, or the, the kind of beginnings of the event. And it really developed from quite a simple brief um, that we gave to Lara and Frederick from Space Popula. Um, and it was really asking them to explore kind of the future potentials of a uh, glass facade system. Um, where they took that was quite unexpected. Um, they started looking into a uh, history of glass architecture. Um, the project up, oh yeah, so I didn't say, the exhibition upstairs is sort of the, the end result of, of, um, that propo uh, of that brief. And it b both looks at kind of this history of glass architecture, but it also looks at the futures of it as well. And that's really what we wanted to kind of focus in on today with today's uh, presentations. Um, so, and they really put forward this question to us with the exhibition upstairs um, that was really asking whether this kind of thinly printed ceramic um, backing on the glass could be considered an augmented reality or a virtual reality. Um, I have to say when they first said it to me, I was a little like, <laughs> not sure about that. Um, but I think it, it's basically laid the kind of foundations for the talk that we're going to kind of continue through the discussion today. So. Um, with that, um, I'd, I'd like to hand over to James Taylor Foster, um, who will be chairing this evening's discussion. Um, James is an architect, writer, and broadcaster, um, also the editor at large at Art Daily. Um, and James, would you like to be uh, make some introductions? Should I introduce that? every now? Okay. Can I? Yes. Do you want to also hold a piece of glass for a while? I will. I'll give you this. Could I have that piece of paper? Oh, yes, of course. Sorry. Thank you. Um, well, just as a kind of brief introduction, I've known Lara and Frederick for, I guess, just over a year, and I'm increasingly amazed every time they do something. I had the first experience of this upstairs just now, and I'm a little bit taken aback. I mean, it's really one of the most sophisticated virtual reality experiences I've ever had, and I've had quite a few. So obviously, Lara and Frederick are the co-directors of Space Popular, um, but they also run the Tools for Architecture Masters Unit at the Architectural Association, which is really, again, you know, one of the most interesting among a very diverse uh, range of studios. Ben Vickers is the Chief Technology Officer at the Serpentine Galleries, and he's also an initiator of the open source monastic order Unmonastery, which I hope he will sort of dive into a little bit during his presentation. And Catherine Vega is an artist and researcher at Chroma.space. So we're going to have presentations from each, and then we're going to have a short discussion, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions from the audience afterwards. So, thank you, Kamala. Replace me on stage. <laughs> How is this? Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for being here. We will be talking about uh, the potential that we see in architecture existing across realities, in connection to the piece that is on show and to some other examples of, of our work. Uh, back in the early 20th century, the utopian correspondence, The Glass Chain, by which this exhibition uh, is highly inspired, uh, they were exchanging ideas for a new format of society implemented by architecture. This group of men believed that through spatial experiences, they could change us. Artists like Hablik and Lukhart, also part of the letter chain, had political visions for their world of colored glass. Their vision for political change relied in a spatial experience. A century later, we are still trying to understand that environments that we inhabit have an effect on us. But Taut, back in 1914, was already convinced that spatial experiences could change our worlds. He openly claimed that the Werkbund Pavilion had no other purpose than to be be beautiful, an argument that perhaps would be a bit controversial today. Even though beauty, through variation, symbolism, semiotics, and meaning, has always been central to the creation of space, it has seen a radical and steady decline in the past hundred years. As modernism simplified and cleans not only services of hygiene and inefficiency, but also our language and ability to articulate the complex nature of architecture beyond its performance and function, we now design featureless spaces imagined from fetishized single viewpoints without consideration of their effect on us, these are spaces that make us sensorially numb. We would argue that we have become spatial illiterates, unaware of the aesthetic, atmospheric, and semiotic implications of the spaces we create. Often do we hear architects describe complex spaces as simply pure nation, 
in lack of linguistic abilities to describe the positive effects of multiple, multiple sightlines, for example. And too often, a complex surface is described as ornamented, missing the opportunity to read the complex and possibly meaningful stories that lie within them. To design architecture driven by experiential cognitive principles, we need to relearn lost vocabularies and elaborate new ones because we are what we have words for. We foresee a potential opportunity for change in both the practice and the experience of architecture. The introduction of new formats of reality through virtual reality technologies marks a paradigm shift as transformative as the discovery of perspective. In this realm, architecture does not need to resolve any problems. Its sole purpose is to provide us with an experience. So what would the criteria for design be in a realm of endless possibility? So taking as an example the piece on show tonight, uh, we can see the transformation of a material that usually is presented as featureless, both to touch and sight, into one full of content, one that we look at and into rather than look through it. Composed of just a few angled sheets of glass, it attracts our gaze with questions of order, repetition, variation, and meaning. Glass is transformed by a layer, layer of content, in this case, a layer of ceramic ink that's burnt into the glass, that reveals the illusion of a virtual world of form and color. A printed layer on the glass adds a virtual layer, much like the painting in a fresco. We see the virtual as the imagined, the immaterial. In this case, the light coming from a projector of the, or the colorful liquid behind your screen reveals an immaterial world that our brain builds. The most complete... The most complete version of this piece is the agglomeration of experiences, physical and virtual, overlaid in real time. The persuasive unity of both worlds is only possible and exists solely in our minds. It is our own construction. It is a figment of our imaginations. What exists in our minds is far beyond the physical volume. Therefore, architecture is built in our minds. So our proposal for a park in Warsaw uh, is also an exercise on cognitive driven design. The site had seen dramatic transformation of a specific palace through fire, remodeling and collapse. And these versions exist largely only today as in written text, but also as small, beautiful fragments once part of a whole. Our proposal joined the few remaining physical parts with prosthetic metal, metal structures and purely virtual representations of the past, all coming together in a public park. An augmented layer of information available through AR devices provides layers of history that together with stories, writings, and the physical presence of the fragments in the site constructs a multidimensional piece of architecture in the brain. So realizing that we simultaneously inhabit different realms of cognition inspires new potential, not only for the experience of architecture, but also for the practice. We would like to conclude with a couple of projects um, that speaks of this idea of ontological design, that what design ends up designing you back. Um, so how is virtual reality technologies, how they are relevant in the practice of architecture. Um, one of the projects has to do with memory and virtual presence, and the other one has to do with imagination. The Cloud of Resilience is both a database where global mortality rates can be visualized and explored, and a virtual platform for the keeping and remembering of the dead. Nearly 100 people die every minute. That makes almost two deaths per second. Geolocated and offset according to time, such data would generate a point cloud of varying densities, revealing the outlines of the most populated places on Earth. If we apply a death rate filter to a given instant in history, we could visualize war, starvation, pandemics, or other mass fatalities taking place in the time frame selected. No matter where, or when, or how, the precise location in space and time of a person's death will generate a point. This point will be the deceased person's unique coordinates in the cloud of resilience. 
Each registered death data point also becomes a note of remembrance, an infinitely particular niche to which messages, presents, photographs, tributes, memorials, elegiacs, odes, can be uploaded and shared with others, depending on the settings established either by the user prior to his or her death or by an authorized post-mortem delegate. Since we cannot relate to the experiences of the deceased, remembrance is our way of dealing with grief as it recalls memories from life. When we read obituaries, we read about life. Short paragraphs, symbols, dates, and photographs together help to create an idea of who that person was and who he or she still is in the memories of friends and family. As an alternative or supplemental event to already existing ceremonies, virtual ceremonies take place at an individual's coordinates in the cloud of resilience. These virtual funereal events promise to fundamentally transform the practices through which the living join together to mourn and commemorate the dead. They are especially necessary in a time in history in which a deceased person's potential mourners may be spread across the globe, more meaningfully connected by virtual rather than physical ties. This will be the interface to access billions of stories archived online in the cloud of resilience. So this was one of our first experiences in designing a, a virtual world. And uh, we realized that whether they are for remembrance or for novel experiences, they require an understanding of human cognition, uh, cognition that is grounded, embodied, and situated. These worlds will, in turn, reshape us. Lastly, we would like to present Manhattan and the Neu Kritika, a visualization archive of the unbuilt 20th century visionary projects from Manhattan. By digitally reconstructing the most remarkable unrealized projects, a common dream for a city is built and inhabited collectively beyond the minds of the creators. The many versions of a city communicated, communicated through images and words forms a new city, a collective dream that can continue to be built whilst it's being perceived. It is the shared construction of a virtual realm. So to conclude, perhaps not very different analysis stream, but certainly more stable, uh, virtual reality will offer access to a realm that we can simultaneously inhabit and create, one where architecture will be pure content in realities where nothing else but experience matters, and in worlds where our construction materials will be light and color and our construction site, the human mind. Thank you. Um, I'm Catherine Vega, and I do my practice from a, uh, a collective called Chroma Space. I'm really glad to be invited here today, and so glad that you ended by talking about dreams and collective dreams, because I, I have to share a confession. <laughs> Over the last five days, I have had repeated nightmares about virtual reality. <laughs> I, there's been this sort of dread of going to represent virtual reality and its emerging potentials when I've been having these uh, nights of um, being in virtual reality experience where I'm chased by dogs. And uh, in, the, in these nightmares, virtual reality was um, affecting civilization. Um, not in a kind of Buddhist enlightenment, non-attachment way, but people were just losing any sense of really caring about any reality they were in because there was this, this sort of disposability to all experiences. So I like the craftsmanship that your project shows and it has really connected with, um, yeah, with my thinking about how we can use creative power to to remember and language values of worth and I think craftsmanship is so much a part of that um, this image actually is made from some group dream work that I do with uh, an artist called Will Scobie going around asking people at a particular event what dreams they've had the night before and 
reaching out to the possibility that maybe in this connected age there are new forms of understanding collective intelligence and new ways that we might be, under, may, might be able to delve into the unconscious and the, the contents of our imagination. Um, and it was initiated by work that I did with a teacher called Apila Colorado, who is, in, who is from the Anaidan tribe. And she has emphasised to me that this way of receiving dreams is very much part of indigenous ways of knowing. And I don't know fully enough about that to be able to language it, but there is there's a shift that I'm noticing. And it has very much been to do with um, the language of cathedrals. And when I was exploring the installation today, I had this... Uh, this real sense that I was a giant standing before a beautiful, ornate cathedral. And it's funny that the cathedrals of France at the moment, they, they are lit up in the night by um, the sonnet lumière. So there's this, this sense of the old cathedrals becoming more virtual and the virtual realms, um, or at least your virtual realms, having the craftsmanship of the old cathedral makers. So I'm not an architect, and I won't try and talk about architecture, but I have worked with, with people and places and communities and spaces with vir using virtual reality as a way of making performances. And the first, so in a way, I'm always interacting with, with place by uh, setting up performances in a, a certain context. The very first project I did was in a town square in Croatia um, on an island called Viz. And it was a VR experiment really made with video. This was before the Oculus Rift and all that technology had arrived. And asked people to look through the eyes of the children of that town. And uh, it was a really strange experience to see parents inhabit their child's bodies and their, their children's perspectives, especially in island communities where um, the future for people growing up in many island communities is really unsure because um, there's a, a raft of socio-economic factors which starts to unpin um, traditional forms of uh, welcoming people into particular jobs. So I've seen virtual reality really interesting as expanding our uh, understandings of other people's experience and the difference of their experience, but also for enlarging on how we feel our own bodies. And this has been in really in relationship to some work that I've done with neuroscientists at the Sackler Centre for consciousness science and other universities and the kinds of multi-sensory illusions that they've been using to basically open up the flexibility of our own body model. And it has been a kind of revelatory experience to me to find tools and practices that use visual and touch to unpin or make flexible where the boundary of our body begins and ends. I'm sure that many of you know this experiment, that it's so simple, that if you've, it, and it really requires you actually to do it. So if you haven't ever done it, you should blow up a kitchen glove when you get home and put it in front of you and hide your other hand um, in a place you can't see and get someone to touch you simultaneously on each of your fingers and on your hands and experience what it is like to feel where you place your arm in space shift across to something which you know really isn't your hand at all. So they do, <coughs> neuroscience do it with a mannequin's hand and I've tried to do it with a variety of things including leaves and lighthouses. Um, <laughs> so I made a variety of... Um, performance experiments when I was in residence at the Sackler Centre. And 
I'm not going to dive into this because it is, it's an old project, but I wanted to bring it here because it was um, in a modernist building built by Wells Coates, which is in Brighton. And so that, that interesting aspect of um, doing a performance in a space which was meant to remodel how we think and how we, uh, how we live together collectively by using these like fine geometric lines and virtual reality, which can really emphasize everything, was, um, was a real, really interesting formative experience. So people would wander around the corridors and the corridors would telescope and expand. And I smuggled them into the lift at the this, this sort of penultimate point, And they had a um, experience of feathers growing out of their hands as they went up in the lift and felt that queasy feeling that you get when you, you go upwards in the lift. And it was an in, a beautiful way to explore like, the visceral experiences which are inside a building anyway. Every time I go up in a lift, you know, you have that sense of possible flight and just to like bring out those experiences inside, um, inside a story or kind of just enlarge upon all of them to, to push the limits of of how you can feel. Um, and this practice has basically involved, over the last five years, me working a lot with touch, because the real exciting thing I find about embodied VR experiences is this element of touch, that you can combine touching something in front of you and holding it in your hands and feeling it and having this embodied and disembodied experience at the same time. Um, so I've been, this is like a very early phase with a feather duster and a uh, very makeshift fan, but I'm sure that you've seen virtual reality experiences that have sort of made this, there's so much technology you can buy now which blows air into people's faces. Uh, so they can feel they're really on a roller coaster. Um, but there's something very tender about the touch of um, a human in these quite expansive experiences. Um, I wanted to dive into the feelings of the body, and it has been so interesting how the technology has evolved during this uh, period of inquiry because when I started off making it, it was simply video and I'll, I'll give you a sense of how I would do touch experiments with video, with this. Oh, that didn't work. So every time they see something in front of them in, in these video goggles, they feel it on their own hands. So they're holding a stone and then feeling the outline of their hands drawn around them with a leaf. And when virtual reality came along, I could start expanding that into a much more interactive kind of experience with a full body avatar. Like in this piece that I made after visiting the Maori community of Parahaka in New Zealand called Gather. And as they're seeing everything, they're feeling um, paintbrushes, little scratchy sensations. So I really want them to embody this weird experience of an eye opening up inside their own hands. And I use things like scent lavender, created fields of lavender, and it was very much about my own experience of opening to a more embodied relationship with the world, with the natural world, and 
wanting to to give that through virtual reality. Um, to end, I just want to go into some of the um, experiments we did with glass because of the theme of this night. And in the workshops that I did in the Sackler Centre, we started off by exploring um, in the most simple way what it was like to um, to see your own face as the face of another, which is quite easy to do if you, if you influence the light shining on either side of a two-way mirror. And enlarged upon that to involve heart sensors so that you could feel your own heart appear in your own reflection and um, have another person suddenly come out of gazing into this reflection, which kind of links to an obsession that I've had all through my artistic career of creating sites of real interiority where people plunge into their own personal being and then opening it up to a meeting or to meet someone else within that space, within that very private, maybe meditative space. And we kept on working with this two-way mirror um, system so that we could tell a story of a meeting as you looked into the mirror and started to mix how people saw themselves with another person. And we found that you started to get a sense of a third person, which was like a relationship space, which wasn't your face and it wasn't someone else's face. Um, and it was really fascinating. So in this project that I've been working on through 2017, I've been trying to do this with virtual reality and make a, a plane of meeting which opens up the little bubble of VR to um, experience another person coming into that bubble. And it's been such a learning because um, it's so intimate. We've done lots of eye-gazing <laughs> experiments and um, plunged into somatic experiencing between people. Uh, and I really resonate with what you say about creating, using words to, to hold these new experiences that in a way we're coming to, to find through this kind of technology. But I've also been experimenting with using images or giving people the freedom to report on the experiences they've been having using visual language. So there is this, this action as an artist making with these, with, in, in a way, learning the tool that you're making with, that you want to make an experience, but you also want to give people room to tell you about what it is they experience. Because if there's anything I've learned doing this work is that people's ex bodily experience is just so incredibly different. And some people are ultra sensitive, and some people, I mean, really need to be screamed at to uh, feel anything. So it's hard to sort of know where to, where to meet them. And what might be too much for one person might be not enough for another. So I'm trying to work out how we can um, create new languages from this and not just with words, because one of the, the wonders that I find in VR is it's embodied and it is, we can go below words, we can talk about, we can talk about presence, we can feel presence. And perhaps there are new ways of languaging exactly what we are discovering together. So that's what I'm exploring in Terra Incognita with the University of Geneva and their Emotion Lab, dancing together with a lot of different people and working out actually what would be a satisfying interaction with another person in virtual reality. You don't just want to have a telephone call because you might as well have a telephone call. That's like, what are the what are the qualities of being in like full body virtual reality that you can't experience um, on a dance floor or just in a performance space that you could construct. So that's like the inquiry that's going on and it becomes like a very philosophical experience making these um, experiences because uh, like the design of this 
is it, it makes this person the centre of their reality, this person the centre of their reality, and then you have to find a system, a wider reality, for them to meet in, and that has a particular geometry and a particular design. So it's like there's something about setting up the systems of interaction themselves that becomes like a, a, a meditation on what interior space within wider experience might be. And I will end on this recently made video of the residency we did at the Flux Lab in Geneva. Thanks. What are these new feelings? Start to grow new senses. Feel out. Most virtual reality experiences, you are quite closed. You know, you're, you're in an individual space. And I have wanted to really open that up. I have been working with virtual reality since 2011. So this is like a dream for me to start to work out how we can go into new places together and to understand each other more, to relate to each other more and to dance in new ways. Discerning what moves below, within, polarity, opening a space to something in your mind, letting something more to happen fresh, ready for something magnetizing. It was a very important thing that Kate and I were able to work together on a daily basis. And uh, therefore, without this type of venue and residency for artists and scientists to work together, it would have been quite challenging. So the Flux offered to us a space uh, and a, an environment in which we can actually work and develop these things, because what we do is also very experimental not only in a scientific sense of the term, but also in an artistic sense of the term. It's a bit of an avant-garde. We are exploring things that are open. And without this type of venue, there would be no way we could do it. I should introduce David before I finish. He is a, uh, a neuroscientist in the University of Geneva, and his work is about um, consciousness and projective geometry. So what we're exploring is how to have, we have this capacity to have embodied experiences, but also imaginative experiences. And, uh, you know, we, we inhabit both all the time. So it is, um, it's interesting to work with the, projective geometries that he uses in his model of consciousness, which kind of link to Rudolf Steiner. And Rudolf Steiner would see projective geometries as having a very spiritual dimension. And I think the cathedrals of this world give, um, give testament to the fact that the underpinning geometries of life have always been seen to hold a mystical uh, quality or truth. But how do we explore that through embodiment and then... Um, move into that space and back again and, and how do we do that together so i will hand over to ben <laughs> okay um so i probably put too much in this it's like 28 slides um and i think an experiment with vr in lots of different ways uh, but Obviously, I'm at the Serpentine, and so I should talk a little bit about what the Serpentine thinks about technology and specifically why it might be interesting for us to work in virtual reality. Uh, so, uh, a little bit on that. So, this is really like kind of a sketchbook of thinking. So, I always feel embarrassed about my slides um, because I tend to make them in an hour beforehand. Uh, so, this is kind of culminated. Uh, a culmination of uh, like placeholder images, stuff that I've pulled out of internal presentations, stuff like this. This is a uh, really overused quote by William Gibson. Uh, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. But 
The Serpentine at the moment, and particularly in terms of my role there, is trying to think about what will the impact be of uh, advanced technologies and how does an institutional form have to respond to that. Uh, we typically talk about this in terms of disruption, etc. A particularly good metaphor, uh, I think, for thinking about the, um, the future and what its impact might be and how we might begin to think about this is to actually think about this in terms of geography. So some people might say, that Silicon Valley is a geographical future, and the way in which the art world and museums and institutions and things like this have to think about interacting with that future is that it comes with an import and an export tax. It speaks of foreign languages, it has an alternative history, and it has unknown customs. Um, and this is a kind of interesting model because the museums and the art world as a whole has been kind of slow to adapt to that technology despite the fact that in the 80s and the 90s you have things like the net art movement, you have new media, those things are never really consolidated back into the museum. So you have a real absence of understanding of how to interact with these things. I don't think it affects architecture so much because there was a much more at stake in architecture, I think, financially and the requirement for efficiency and new tools and things. And this is not necessarily something that's required when you're dealing with like new materials and symbolism and so social capital and the, the thoughts and thinking of the artist. This is from J.G. Ballard, so this is a quote that I often use to justify why we might be working these technologies. So science, technology multiply around us. To an increasing extent, they dictate the languages in which we speak and think. Either we use those languages or we remain mute. So we're asking the question of, this is Gartner's hype cycle. So on the uh, axis going up, you have expectation going along horizontally. I think most people in this room would be familiar with this model, but it's, uh, essentially it's a way of tracking trends. So you have the innovation trigger, so it's when new discoveries are made in technology, the peak of, inf the peak of inflated expectation, so you've got like probably blockchain up here, uh, the trough of disillusionment, augmented reality, the slope of enlightenment, virtual reality, and then the plateau of productivity. Uh, virtual reality, this is the point when we start working with things. We're interested in what if an art institution begins to work in this area? And the reason for that is because the way in which technologies tend to innovate <coughs> is if we think about most of the applications that we know of the web now, these specific things needed to happen. So whether it's a social web, video 3G, you can't have Airbnb and Uber and things like this until this happens. And we're in this moment, and this is a kind of weird moment, and everybody's very excited about what VR and AR might mean and how, and how that might change the nature of reality, but it gets really fucking scary when you start to put these things together. Um, and <laughs> so, big jump, uh, but essentially, <laughs> we are interested in what happens if you can bring artists and people that somehow identify with some kind of creative practice into this moment in the development of new technologies because we think that actually uh, they might be able to have an impact in diversifying the way in which we think about what these technologies might do rather than just like disrupting the whole planet and creating ethical crisis for everybody. So uh, because we're interested in working in new technologies, the main virtual reality piece that the Serpentine has developed so far, despite having looked at this technology and been in discussion, about it for many years, to the, in, to the extent that the only people that I was talking to about virtual reality three years ago was uh, property developers. Um, and now everybody's talking about it, and that's great. So we developed a virtual reality series of experiences with Zaha Hadid Architects and Google uh, for our exhibition last year. And the exhibition focused on Zaha Hadid's paintings up until the point prior to actually building any buildings. So that's a particularly, I think most people are familiar with the architecture and probably Zaha Hadid's practice more than I come from art. Uh, but that moment really represents a kind of turning point in the practice. And simultaneously, you get the introduction of the use of special effects uh, software and things of this nature. So these kinds of painting, this is the great utopia, uh, that were put forward as kind of plans for buildings. Um, when you had the introduction of uh, 3D software, there was suddenly this moment in which you could conceptualize and begin to render these things into reality. And so it served, this is the VR version of the Great Utopia, so it served as an interesting uh, kind of uh, tool for interpretation and really to explain to an audience uh, that kind of transition point, something that would have otherwise only been able to happen in the mind in the way that you talk about, about architecture as the main 
the, the mind and maybe consciousness being the main site for that. And this was Leicester Square. Um, I think what was interesting about this project was the was a kind of technical proposal in it. So there were three layers to the technology that we built. So you obviously had the the, the kind of um, the three D unfolding environment, uh, but we also had this kind of experimental connects that was tracking people moving around the building. And then we were of course in one of Zaha Hadid Architects buildings, which is a Sackler Serpentine Gallery. And it put, and so when you entered the headset for the first time, you had this kind of like 3D modeled frame where you could see through the building. And most people didn't notice, but actually you, if you looked in one direction and you moved a bit, you might have noticed that there was a kind of point cloud version of yourself. That's this kind of outer body experience. And what was interesting in the proposal of like where this would go next if we were to do another version was the potential for collapsing those things three things together. So that these paintings and these essentially like aestheticized environments could become a kind of visual algorithm through which you'd envision the restructuring of the building you're in based on real time data coming in. Now, obviously, that's not necessarily what you saw in the galleries, but I think that was one of the most interesting elements of what we discussed in the process. I'm not actually allowed to talk about too much that we're working on at the moment. So I'll show you some pictures, the Serpentine <laughs> Pavilion. Um, <laughs> and already in the development of Francis Carey's uh, pavilion this year, there was the use of uh, VR and augmented reality as a tool for thinking through how we might uh, structure the building. And really from a kind of engineering perspective, um, and obviously we're asking this question, um, but we're also asking the question of how will architects design uh, the buildings and cities of the future? And what new contexts and conditions will they need to imagine? And certainly when I met you guys for the first time, you were probably the first people that were really, really thinking this through in a very like imaginative way. And I don't think I've presented this to you, and maybe it's too soon, but this has become a kind of research project. So we've been thinking about, well, we have this problem as a museum that uh, we really rely on the white cube and the art, the art historical context in which to present work. Um, most artists that are producing are responding to that kind of conceptual history. So we have this issue when we go into virtual reality as an institution because we're not necessarily creators ourselves, but we facilitate and we curate. So what do you do? So loads of people are recreating the museums and the institutions, which seems totally bizarre in a world in which you can do anything. Um, so we are looking at the possibility of founding an autonomous an island, an autonomous world using blockchain, uh, in virtual reality, narrated by science fiction writers, and the idea being that we commission a text, we work with a games design company, and then once we have that world, that becomes the conditions in which we commission new architecture. And then if that's successful in year two, we might commission artists to design animals that can live in it, if I can pass it that far. The interesting thing about this in the context of an institution is so far, museums and institutions haven't been able to do software as service. So if we can figure out how to do that, then we have this really interesting touring model that also, if we were to build partnerships globally with other institutions, could contribute to building a new kind of world. Now, the art world isn't very open source, so let's see how it goes. Uh, state of virtual reality. So I recently wrote this article about the impoverishment of the imagination in respect to virtual reality. And so we all know that in 1991 that we already did all of this. Uh, we already had all of these conversations. We already did all the blueprints for all of the plans. And in many ways, if you go back and read that stuff, it's much, much more exciting than everything else that's going on. I particularly recommend Virtual Reality and, and Electronic Highs, which is an interview with Yaron Lanier and Terence McKenna. And it's in this interview that Terence McKenna plants the idea in Yaron Lanier's head that actually what we should be using virtual reality for is to develop a new visual language. So we should be more like octopuses and we should change the color on our skin as a form of telepathy for communicating with each other. And that would be really a much better use than anything else. Siberia charts basically the intersection of house music, no tropics, VR, uh, and all of the kind of exciting things that probably we're not allowed to do anymore. Uh, Yaron Lanier proposed that this was not like a tool. This was a new reality that we would inhabit. Um, this is a particularly important work that happens in 2008 by uh, Mika Cardenas uh, called Becoming Dragon. 
So Mika was going through uh, transition, going from being a man to a woman, and inhabited, so there's this period of time in which you have to uh, kind of embody that other gender before you're allowed to have transition. And so what they did was they did becoming dragon. So for, I can't remember how many hours, but it was days. Uh, they embodied a dragon in Second Life. And I think this is a particularly important work that many people forget about. What do we currently have? So we've got Facebook spaces, we've got uh, people on doing exercise, so we've got people recreating office spaces, because that's where we want to work. And in High Fidelity, which is a really great online social space, their major innovation is a whiteboard. Now, if I was to use virtual reality, the last thing I want to be doing is writing on a whiteboard. So, I'll tell you a little bit about the kinds of things I do in my personal time. Uh, you mentioned before that I was a kind of initiator for this project called Our Monastery. That is essentially, took me on a very weird path, uh, but we were looking, essentially we realized that the Benedictine rule is the earliest uh, example of open source software. Um, and that it has all these kind of forking paths into different orders and that this single text was able to give rise to thousands of monasteries all over Europe. And we thought that was interesting and we thought, what does that mean to now? So we basically kind of uh, larked this thing uh, called our monastery where we became a, a new kind of monastic order, but it opened up this very interesting space for thinking about different ways of producing technology. And out the back of that, I've started other projects, the Non-Aligned Technology Group. Uh, I'm interviewing people in the Amish community about how you develop technologies being off-grid. Uh, we're interviewing uh, the Jewish community in North London about kind of workarounds for the Sabbath. Uh, all kinds of situations in which uh, constraints on the reality that you inhabit change your rela relationship to technology. And so that kind of might explain the context of some of these things. So one of the things that I started developing with my friend Kia Kreutler when we were in our monastery, are people familiar with the method of Loki, the memory palace? So this ancient technique for being able to enhance your memory, which is basically that you, ha you use a physical space, so this room, and you assign different memories to different objects or people or whatever. And then when you want to remember whatever those set of memories were, you go back to that place. And it's very, very good for memory enhancement. So you've seen with some language apps, you like walk down a street and it assigns objects and this is a really good way to learn a language. So we constructed uh, Gobel Tepe. So people are familiar with this. So this is a site that was discovered in the last decade in kind of on the border of Turkey and Syria that disrupts the human narrative of uh, the progress of civilization because it shows that hunter-gatherers actually did build structures before they built cities and agriculture came along and there's evidence of agriculture on a kind of more nomadic basis. And so we use that as a context to build this memory palace in which multiple people can tell a story to each other. And then that becomes a collective narrative in which they inhabit. Um, I have friends that do a lot of breath work. I'm not into it. Um, but they do the kind of breath work where after like four or five years of uh, practicing certain ways of breathing, you can lower your body temperature and things like this. Now, what I'm interested in is uh, how you use physiological techniques and ways of training the body with real skills that then allow you to encrypt virtual environments so that you can, well, in some ways, you could create a uh, yoga order that meant that only people at a certain level of enlightenment through Kundalini were able to access different uh, areas through using hacked breathalyzers uh, and things like this. So I, uh, this is something that I'm prototyping at the moment. Uh, it was inspired by uh, this guy I met in Berlin that had created this amazing device uh, that kind of monitored your, br your, the diapha your diaphragm as you were breathing. And if you could stabilize your breath, uh, you could levitate off the ground in virtual reality. So you kind of hack this thing as a, uh, as a, as a controller. Uh, the other thing I'm working on, and I'm just building the technology stack for it at the moment, is what I call generous, general purpose shrine technology. Now, I think that this uh, could be really appealing to religions of the world. It's not necessarily my intention. Um, but the ability to create shrines that can accept Bitcoin and Ethereum as uh, kind of quasi-spiritual spaces. Because you know how you throw money off a waterfall, you drop money at a shrine and it imbues it with power and then that thing contributes to that religion growing bigger and bigger? 
What's interesting with Bitcoin and Ethereum is you can actually lock in the money. So you can go to the you can go to the virtual shrine, whether it's augmented reality, whether it's virtual reality, and maybe you attach it to a space using this amazing protocol called Foam Space, uh, and you could see that like somebody has donated like a hundred million to a statue of I don't even want to think about what it would be. Uh, and that that money can never be removed. So it kind of embodies that power. And depending on what kind of belief system you subscribe to, this can have interesting effects on the world. Uh, is anybody into astral projection? Uh, so there's all of these strange <laughs> guided meditation VR apps. Uh, and what I was like, this is kind of interesting. I'm going to try this out. So get the, the headset on and like I'm sitting on a beautiful beach and I'm relaxing and I'm, I'm meditating. I close my eyes because that's what you do at meditation. You look inside in a space. Problem is it's backlit and you've got this like bright light. So I was like, I started to kind of hack around with things. And then when I was like midway through hacking a headset, like destroying a 700 pound piece of equipment, uh, I realized that actually in the next edition, they're going to start uh, like clocking where your eyes move. Um, but what's interesting is actually if you began to combine this stuff and you are into astral projection or any kind of uh, kind of mm, out of body experience, kind of walking through different spaces in your mind, that you can progressively get very, very far away from your body if you're augmenting that with virtual environments. Now, this is not recommended and I wouldn't ever release this kind of technology on the internet because it would, it would probably break people. Uh, the last thing, so Alexander Shulgin wrote this great thing, uh, a chemical love story. So Alexander Shulgin was the person who invented MDMA, but he also created 2CB. And uh, online, there are these really good communities where people are basically experimenting, not just with illicit substances that you shouldn't be using in virtual reality, uh, but also these kind of somatic techniques and stuff like this. And in A Chemical Love Story, it's like a fictional love story between him and his wife. And then it's like all of these different experiments and describing the conditions that they produced. And it seems to me that there's a certain debt owed to history uh, in terms of uh, really pushing out where this space can go and where it can take you. Um, so I'm producing a book. So if anybody wants to contribute a particular virtual reality experience uh, under whatever conditions, that would be very welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, we also didn't mention, and um, we're all into experimenting tonight, so actually I'm going to be doing some live Googling um, while the discussion continues. So if anyone wants me to Google anything, come and whisper in my ear. <laughs> okay. Everybody's head sort of turned 45 degrees. There's not much time for this, so I want to get straight into a really intense question. And it centers on the idea of human experience and human perception, you touched upon it a little bit, Catherine, when you talked about the kind of complexities of the individual, right? Mm -hmm. And how people receive these experiences. And I wonder to what extent, maybe we can begin with you, Fred and Lara, to what extent that has factored into the work that you've created upstairs or in other work? Um, that's a very big question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I would begin a kind of answer to a question like that by saying it was kind of brought up in very interesting ways through the other talks um, about what we might call, so that people know what we're talking about, re linguistic relativity again. But more than linguistic relativity, meaning <clears throat> the words that you know and that you, you can access actually kind of inhabits, in, inhibits your thinking. And in a sense, I think the kind of experiences that we've created upstairs are designed before it's experienced, obviously, which means that it's a completely different mind, an individual that came up with it. Because we're in a moment now, it was really interesting, Ben's perspective, which is so true, of like, of the kind of 90s or 80s kind of uh, yeah. very direct visions of, of what this might be. Because the technology was even there, even though it was really uh, not as advanced as it is today, of course. But um, so I think the way that an experience certainly designing one, but just experiencing it the way it changes you quite completely in some, in some ways. Um, 
means that the, the kind of before and after you is actually in the case of the technology that we're working with right now, uh, the before and after is so radical that that actually the decisions that you might make for future experiences or as the technology evolves, it's almost it's a great disconnect, which is very interesting, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think even from, yeah, from an even more superficial level, I was fascinated by the eye tracking technology that you were using because it certainly lends a kind of sophistication to the actual process, which I think I haven't seen before. But this notion of interiority or the idea, the kind of juxtaposition between the fact that you are isolating yourself in an experience, but then, of course, that's just you know 10% of where it could be and where it should go. This question of meeting and this question of experiencing it with others in a really tangible way was really fascinating. And I wondered whether you could project that maybe, that idea a little bit further and sort of explain where or how you think that's going to maybe change things. Yeah, I just don't know whether that is what creative practice does. And in a way, thank God, because the nightmares I'm having about virtual reality, <laughs> like, they're, they're yeah. pretty sensible. Just, um, as a quick, just as a quick aside, I found it very interesting that you were talking about this dog chasing you in a dreamscape. Yeah. Being an, I mean, in virtual reality. I mean, I thought dreamscape and virtual reality there, you were sort of conflating the two. No. The, the, uh, my dreams have become very meta. I mean, dreaming is <laughs> pretty like, meta, exactly you know, that. where the hell do we end and begin? Yeah. So, I don't know, what I, my particular journey with virtual reality began in a science lab and I have been walking further and further away from the science lab and been lucky enough to visit and go on residencies with different indigenous communities and this has really broadened the um, my sense of what human perception can be mm. that it is not simply the scientific paradigm um, and that there can there's a dangerous kind of colonization of um, interior space that can go on if we let neuroscientists have the final word on what our subjective experience is. That's interesting, is. yeah. So all these experiences of yeah. being in, say, the Maori community in Parahaka, it's not only that there's different ways of perceiving the world or feeling relationship with the mountains and the rivers, but there's different ways of speaking. So I gave a, a very academic um, paper that I'd written in um, the New Zealand community and I looked out at 10 minutes in and everyone was asleep and I <laughs> thought right yeah now you speak like that in a particular realm yeah. and you speak from the heart in this meeting space so it, I feel like there is an opportunity if we can use it sensitively and if we can like craft um, relational experiences in virtual reality to begin to respect these different dimensions of what human experience is and not lump everything. Um, it, the Western perspective really needs a grand renewal. And mm. the, the hope that I have working with it is that we can begin to, through shared experiences, um, come out of our very myopic way of viewing human perception. Yeah, and there's certainly there is that scale of you know, two or more people. There's also world building. Right, as, as a notion, of, and I think that now I understand what a monastery is, mm -hmm. right, which in some way is, is, sounds fascinating, and I mean, I'm going to have to talk to you more about that, but the notion of your kind of world building through text or through language, you're creating these kind of nodes and networks historically, and also the project that you're doing now at the Serpentine in terms of trying to create illusory worlds in relation to this, I find this also particularly interesting because of the kind of globalized nature of technology. And I wonder to what extent uh, you relate that kind of larger scale uh, application of VR with the kind of smaller scale applications of VR between two people. Uh, I mean, I think there's an enormous amount at stake. Uh, I'm scared in the same way I was scared when everybody signed up to Facebook who didn't use MySpace beforehand, <laughs> um, that there is a kind of aesthetic imperialism that uh, delineates the uh, structure through which you see the world. Yeah. So, you know, the, the classic thing of being able to uh, lay out your MySpace however you liked, um, lay, you know, use as many GIFs as you liked, and the, the kind of community that that uh, led to, to the kind of static 
um, kind of framed perspective of, um, of Facebook. And I think that it's clear that Facebook spaces will try and create that same kind of dominance. And if you look at the kind of language at play there and the just the basic functionality, it's like very, very limited. But that extends also to things like high fidelity, which is this, it's actually by, created by the founder of uh, Second Life. And I find it, I always find it amazing when I see him in this space, which isn't very, is, is probably populated as much as Second Life. Um, but he, he's wearing like jeans and a t-shirt. He's not like a dragon. Um, and I, and I find that, I find that very strange. And I, and I guess in terms of, um, kind of thinking at a, a larger scale, I think there are very, very few places in the world in which, uh, an alternative perspective for a technology that's so expensive and technically complex to develop, uh, the art world is, is one of the few places in which you might be able to platform a different perspective. Uh, so I guess that's why yeah. I'm not just in a monastery with my headset. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, and I want to just take just take that one step further and ask this to, to everybody is, you know, there is it was very interesting seeing the Gartner hype cycle sort of on the screen again and particularly looking at the machine learning, right, which is certainly as far as technology is sort of developing, that's kind of a crucial aspect of how these are the, of the focusing the direction and machine learning is in many ways about taking things in a direction which maybe you can't control and it's sort of lifting a little bit from the creative industries i think to a certain degree your, your comment about facebook is very interesting because you're totally right i mean the whole creative aspects of social media is kind of sucked out of it and framed right so you feel one of 100 different feelings that you can input into a into the social network but i wonder from your perspective maybe are you open to that that notion of sort of giving up some creative agency in future projects related to virtual reality? Um, yeah, it depends on how interesting the discussion with these agencies would be. Yeah. Right? Um, but to, going back a bit to your points on how perhaps the aesthetics or the these virtual spaces are so framed by perhaps like these Facebook spaces and how people will start using those and not question them or like start being a guy on jeans and a t-shirt rather than a dragon. I think, I mean, I understand that that can seem frustrating or even scary, uh, as you were saying, but I think there's a very important issue that I find interesting now. Um, that is that we see in virtual reality that spaces are being replicated, right? We are making spaces as the ones we experience in the world. And rather than being disappointed by that, I actually find that really exciting because mm. they are the ones that give you the most powerful experience so far, just because we don't have a language to understand the possible abstraction that VR will take us to. But if you take this back to the beginning of architecture, right, we started doing columns that looked like trees, capitals that had leaves. And then eventually it's gotten to levels of abstraction that are incredible. It's become a language in itself. That I foresee could possibly be the path that it will take on, but it will take some time. And <laughs> if we start from complete abstraction, or if, for example, if, if we in introduce machine learning and then like they go so much faster than our own minds, then perhaps we will miss the boat. And maybe that's why, like I remember the first time you were talking about, can you imagine another <laughs> VR winter? Maybe <laughs> that's why there was one, because they went so far mm. into sci-fi. And now, Funnily enough, then, their visions of how this world should look like have become cliché to us, like the blue neon and stuff, yet unrelatable to abstract, right? So in a way, the gimmickry, I think it's, it's crucial in the beginning. Mm. And mm. then the possible introduction of mm. automated processes or uh, artificial intelligence processes in design, yes, they may come, but for us to catch up with them would yeah. require some fine tuning you yeah. know, of uh, balancing this yeah, evolution. I wonder the you know something that I thought of while I was you know experiencing that was it was this notion of kind of scenography as a as a way of constructing artificial worlds, mm -hmm. and I wondered whether you could expand a bit on the correlation between how you approach a project like this and how, for example, someone would approach. Um, designing the set of Ghost in the Shell or designing the set of, 
of any kind of you know contemporary sci-fi film, which in some ways are grounding themselves ever more into a reality that we are familiar with potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in, in that question brings up also the the kind of question of format, because we're so you know you you have the the physical thing that you put on your head, but the the format that it's used in or the way it's manifested can be very different. And in this case, everything is quite clearly like a model or a prototype of, of something, which then frames it in a format, in this case, a kind of gallery setting. I was interested to hear from Ben, and maybe be interesting to hear more about how that kind of format thinking can maybe would have to change, uh, certainly with the ambitions that the Serpentine has. Mm. And I think that it's clear that for the experience that some of you have experienced, um, what you're showing upstairs, it's narrative driven, even if we don't get to know any specific characters and there's no narration, but it is a narrative. You're, you're being taken through. The format is very constrained in that sense. And of course, it's a prototype of a type of experience that perhaps could be much larger than that. It's a sort of a, a proposal for a promise for something that could come where this upstairs is a model of a building that's much larger as you experienced, but what if every building you'll ever experience is a potential enhanced virtual version? And then with that, going back to the, to the kind of provocation of why is it all ref, um, referential? And as Larry was talking about, I think it's a super interesting thing to talk about because it's in VR, technically every, everything is possible, which means that what you input, if you don't put in random, something completely random, it's going to be referential. I think that's a super interesting constraint. Mm. And one of my favorite 90s references is the, the original Vanilla Sky film, which is a, a Mexican movie, where this very wealthy person um, gets a choice to create a virtual or kind of a dream world for himself um, to hibernate in. And he won't know that he's having this dream. And uh, he chooses a virtual world which is almost identical to, to the life he had. He just gets the girl and his face is no longer disfigured. He could have been a dragon. But everything is referential down to almost identically. Just a little bit better. Just a little bit better. Yeah. The girl is a little bit more beautiful and <laughs> doesn't have his face. And there's always a vanilla, vanilla sky. Um, so, so that's the thing that we were doing upstairs also. I mean, you're inhabiting a landscape with mountains, with water. It's a very basic thing. It's just a little bit better, maybe, or a little bit more colorful, or um, arranged in a way that you usually don't find when you're surrounded by mountains. Yeah. So you just bring up the mountain a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we should hold that thought, but I just want to also touch upon this notion of formats that you mentioned, Frederick, because there is an interesting situation as an institution where you are in some way trying to, I suppose, outpace, but also be aligned with the tech industry mm. in terms of this. I mean, you talk about hacking, you know, the kind of the kind of technology on a personal level. Mm. I mean, I wonder in this respect, I, for example, as soon as I was up that was up in 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 your experience, I was thinking, how would an institution collect this, you know, as a kind of physical object and something which, you know, exists in a format which might not be usable in 20 years' time or might need specialist equipment? Mm -hmm. And I wonder, from your perspective, how you or the institution are maybe thinking about these problems. I can answer the collection one easily. <laughs> you no? don't have a collection. Okay. <laughs> Please abstract so we yourself. Would, we would prefer that to MoMA, who has really great experts on collecting digital works. Um, but in terms of uh, that kind of question of like aligning with the tech industry, I actually think that I think a couple of things. I think that one, a lot of what's happening in technology right now is entering domains of expertise where they are not experts and I say that having come from like a technology background um, whether that's deciding to run taxi services and finding out that there are regulations and workers rights or uh, it is architecture or the exploration of spatial environments that there are other fields of knowledge that you can't just come in 
and say, well, we're taking this over. <laughs> um, because there is a kind of implicit and also a kind of tacit knowledge within those fields that has been developed over centuries that is probably relevant to the development of it. So I, I think that we, actually, I think that technology, the increasingly, based on, both on that uh, basic need to asset strip the domain expertise out of certain fields before taking them over, uh, there's that. But then I think that also what we're seeing in, and this is certainly probably bias, like what I think we're seeing in the development of certain technologies is um, kind of a shift in perception and a way of seeing reality that doesn't, is not what's expected. So if you take the example of like say neural networks, uh, and where the development of that research is, and you take something like Google's Deep Dream, and they were like, let's look, let's look inside the black box and see what's inside. And then they open the black box, and it's dogs crawling out of spaghetti. <laughs> and it's like, well, put that back in the box. <laughs> uh, but the more that you speak to people that are working in these like research departments, they're like, they do need the kind of lateral thinking of people in other spaces in order to address that issue because they keep putting things in a black box and it's like the right answer comes out. We don't really understand why, but it works every time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's like, you do kind of need people that have been thinking on the lateral plane for a long, like a long time to be like, it's okay. Mm. That happens, you mm. know, surrealism <laughs> a century ago. Yeah. Like these kinds of like, so I think, yeah, I mean, that, Makes yeah, sense yeah, in yeah. Terms of like I mean, where we the, may be trying to position ourselves. <laughs> yeah, or position these technologies mm. as kind of uh, through a, through a critical lens. I think it's it's fascinating. The other thing which I think perhaps tangentially relates to this, which really fascinated me, Catherine, was this notion of um, designing interaction or designing the geometries of interaction, which seems to be taking all of these different kind of almost competing ideas of. of or competing inputs of virtual reality and then sort of reframing them in a way which makes sense to people who might not be completely au fait with how these things are put together and structured and you know trying to simplify them and strip them to something which you know is usable mm -hmm. and I wonder I mean it's, it's just fascinating because how do you perceive your practice within the kind of wider tech industry I mean who's like how, yeah I mean it's <laughs> because I think your, your individual like, practice is really I just interesting I feel like I'm straying very far at the moment <laughs> and asking uh, I, I mean I really have been in a lot of tech expos and a lot of science meetings and that experience is um, is uh, making me consider um, you know not cleverly positioning myself or um, asking you know what would marginally improve people's comfort levels mm. but asking things which are crazy questions like what does the earth need or what what might like what my octopus say <laughs> <laughs> like i feel like there's a whole uh, um a whole <laughs> underlying reality being uh, completely ignored so i don't know hopefully shifting towards some sort of useful radical <laughs> that would be like for me the possibilities that you speak about linking blockchain and virtual reality, uh, there's like something in that which isn't just a metamorphosis in perception, which everyone was banging on about in the 1960s and 1970s, but the possibility of a metamorphosis in human action. And that's, yeah, that's a kind of undescribable, you can't really overstate that, but there's uh, like a radical, um, a radical potential. Mm. Well, I think we'll just open it up to the audience. And I'm going to just begin with a rather provocative statement because I'm assuming that the majority of people here are in the architectural sphere. Um, spatial illiteracy in architecture. Maybe you could just sort of expand on that a little bit as, as, a, as, a, as a notion. It's a fascinating thing, a deeply provocative thing to say, I think. And then maybe we can, uh, you know, if you have a question or you want to respond to that, just put your hand up. Sure, yeah. It's hard to share. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it comes out of, uh, out of our young practice and sort of interest that we have. And 
a lot of interests that we have. Maybe some of them we were not taught in school. And I think we've realized that color, for instance, we work with a lot of color and we never really had any training to think or talk about color. And uh, we realized that actually, how do we even begin? Or how do we even, and that kind of expands on exploration. We also work with a lot of sometimes very directly symbolic references from historic, arch historic architecture, which we can do because we know what they're called. We don't just take a photograph and we copy it, but we talk about squinges, we talk about coins, we talk about friezes, we talk about scrolls or the cantus leaves or whatever. And yeah, but not only names of ornaments. I mean, we, we make this call to like, there is a situation which is with spatial illiteracy in architecture a little bit. I mean, it's not doomsday or anything, but <laughs> the moment that someone that has designed the interior of a casino can explain you better the experiential sequence than a Pritzker Prize architect can. Mm. That's what we want to get at. Yeah. Like, explain me in comprehensible words. It's, it's a very basic issue that, that we're talking about, and it has a lot to do with us being involved in education. That is like, explain me what is it that this space is doing to me without poetry, and without complicated words and without mind twists. Just, mm. if you can explain it, you can work with it. Mm. Things might be beautiful in a photograph, materials, surfaces might be nice or might be trendy, mm. but there is experiential qualities of the space that you can name and you can explain why they are mm. having a certain effect. And that is something that seems like it belongs more to the world of, as I was saying, casinos and shopping malls than to the world of yeah. museums by incredible it's, Exactly, it's an interesting statement because obviously you think of the casinos of Las Vegas and it's true, they are essentially the ultimate in architectural representation of a reference, the ultimate in interaction and the ultimate in technology in many ways. Like, it's incredibly sophisticated on all of these levels. Um, and you wonder whether like, in terms of commercial, uh, commercial business, they would surely be the first to sort of realise and harness yeah. virtual and augmented realities in, in a way. I mean, I think that that's a very interesting observation. Does anybody have anything they want to input at this point? Or we'll just keep on talking. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, well. We took it to the ground. <laughs> exactly, we're, into, we're stepping into swampy territory. Um, but I mean, certainly um, there is, I think, uh, a sense of urgency now with this technology now. Would you agree with that, or do you think the urgency was in the 90s or in the 60s, and we're now sort of responding to that? I mean, I think the urgency comes from the intersection of, um, on your point uh, a second ago, the, the thing that scared me the most <clears throat> was the person that I know the most about AI describing uh, something that he wanted to build, which is essentially kind of like Clockwork Orange. So you use uh, one of those, you can get these kind of cheap, I forget what they're called, but for monitoring your brain. So you can like do, you can yeah. control your environment with your brain signals, like quite straightforwardly, but you can also map them. So you can do a weird thing where you can like show your, you can run thousands of images in front of your eyes, and then you can use this brain reader to scan them. And then you should use a machine, you build a machine learning data set in order to change your perception and you just run it on yourself for like a day and you know the science is there to say that this thing would really screw you up yeah uh, and we don't know how uh, but it was moments like that that kind of terrified me because at the moment the haptics are really like far behind so it's like and by it really, what do you mean by the like haptics the, the, you've just got the headset and the sound and yeah. maybe if you're lucky you've got some controllers okay, yeah, but yeah, you're not yeah. wearing like a whole suit yeah. and, and things like this so, um, but that's coming I mean, it's really close. So it's, it's not going to be that long until you are, well, I don't know. It depends what you're into. But <laughs> until you're, like, strapped into a, a weird suit and you've also got a brain monitor on your head. But, you know, in the same way as, like, the new iPhone scans your face, these are just going to be features. And then you're going to be able to run all kinds of, like, weird experiments on yourself. So mm -hmm. I think it's urgent if. And that's if that we think about what are we doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but that's always the truth. I mean, humanity has an amazing uh, ability to blindly walk into situations, right? I mean, we're the only species who have literally designed our own exit from this planet mm -hmm. by splitting the atom. And, I mean, it's always done with the best intention to start <laughs> with. But then, only like, 50 years later, you think, my God, that might have not been the best thing to do. And I wonder, also, from the point of view, you know, your, your respect, 
sort of perspectives on this situation. Maybe you could just summarize um, before we desperately seek a question from the audience. <laughs> um, one thing which you think you are particularly concerned or excited about, let's say over the next decade, from like from the creative side or technology side or whatever. Practicing in in both realities. That's what I feel it's most urgent to be uh, or like uh, I, I am looking forward the most. Yeah. It's to be able to practice across and in parallel, both in the physical and virtual worlds. Yes. But in terms of a of a concern, uh, I wouldn't sorry. I wouldn't uh, want to uh, end I wouldn't want to end on, on that note because yeah. it's <laughs> but uh, I, I think that when we spoke about this before, I think that there's a possibility perhaps that the technology moves so fast that it creates such a, a, a kind of awesome experience that it, it creates a backlash, that it's, it's, that it's so immersive and so it changes our perception and the way we live so dramatically that you see a kind of even potentially loss kind of in France, it's illegal for, for for children to see 3D movies because they don't know exactly how it affects your brain to use these glasses. And you know, there are concerns. I just hope that the technology and the innovation goes in a pace where it doesn't scare the general public. Uh, I don't want to end on this point, but I, I do think that there's a possibility because certainly uh, you know, there's a few steps in technology in human recent human history that has been too scary uh, to even deal with. as McLuhan speaks of this kind of yeah. curve of like a technology being so shocking that we don't even really perceive it. We're just like, okay, that I did that didn't happen. Like I didn't even, and it only becomes a part of our lives much later on when it's not shocking anymore. Yeah. Okay, so pressure for an optimistic point, but first, <laughs> Catherine. Well, I think it's something about the imagination and um, us understanding. Well what a healthy imagination, a healthy creative imagination, and the unconscious, which I still think, especially, well, maybe not especially technology culture, but we're not very mature yet in our understanding of how the unconscious influences our constant innovation. Mm. Um, so the most interesting things that I'm seeing in virtual reality are these um, uh, experiments towards new um, therapeutic techniques. Mm. I saw one which uh, involved having an avatar who looked like Sigmund Freud and you <laughs> spoke to the avatar and you said the problem you were dealing with and then the perspective shifts and Sigmund Freud, the avatar, speaks back your problem but as Sigmund Freud, <laughs> which is already like very strange. And then you advise Sigmund Freud, who has just told you a problem, which is your problem, but as Sigmund Freud, what to do. And then that is played back to you from the Sigmund Freud avatar. And I thought, my God, that is something, you know, the, the way that we basic, the beautiful thing about relationship is that we step out of our own experience, we see it from new perspectives. And, um, this kind of movement towards being more like, responsible for our uh, psychology, for our imaginations. Like, there are potentials within virtual reality yeah, yeah. in that. And yeah. in also relating to the wider systems of the Earth. Climate data is really hard to get our heads around because it is horrifying. Mm. Um, but there are ways of making that tactile and visceral. And I feel like introducing a global perspective that is really hard to handle um, in ways which are intimate and involve touch and involve group experience, there is possibilities there. Yeah, yeah. it's true. I often think that the, one of the most interesting things about human thought, which just goes all the way back to kind of Aristotle, is that whenever there's a really big problem, we existentialize it and we kind of locate it over there. So we say global warming, but we don't allow ourselves to actually effectively deal with that in our in our own real small way mm -hmm. and thereby these things don't get solved so quickly mm, it's but shifting between the, both of those it's functions it's really interesting because yeah. we, 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 we become disembodied in some way to deal with it but then we need to Absolutely. we need to practice the shift responsibility for our own that's very interesting <laughs> Ben I was just thinking when you said um, <clears throat> this thing about the potential for banning technologies and actually in that Yaron Lanier interview he's very uh, it's very clear that the, sh 
Terence McKenna shouldn't be associating VR with psychedelics <laughs> yes. because there is a risk of it being banned as a result. And there was a real yeah. genuine belief that virtual reality could be banned as a result of, say, the war on drugs. Um, optimism, <laughs> uh, the finalism. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, my involvement in all of these things and what I find interesting is that I, I believe that these are necessary uh, spaces for training, uh, for dealing with the unknown, um, and that the kind of certainty is not necessarily something that we should be uh, seeking and that things are going to get much, much, much weirder. <laughs> um, and much scarier <laughs> and the best thing that you can do is prepare yourself for that um, and if that means using these technologies then and just become comfortable with it you know just kind of go with the flow and you know if mm. if next year we're geoengineering the planet because that's what we want to do then that's what we're going to do <laughs> because there aren't many ways of stopping certain like, geopolitical trajectories over the next decade I don't think Okay. <laughs> well, that, 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 the last four have really got quite intense. But uh, does anybody still have no? I mean, if not, I know for a fact, and correct me just if I'm keep wrong. Making it more oh, we have so. one here. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, imagine, look, I'm familiar with Frederick's, Frederick Lara's work. We grew up together doing architecture together. So um, I guess all I want to ask is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you do believe mixed realities, augmented realities, all these words are just, uh, they will come together to uh, as just only reality. And um, so in the future where all these things do come together, in fact, physical, uh, physical objects could actually morph in a way virtual objects do morph these days. You have shape-shifting walls, walls that can become ornaments, become flat in, in the click of a button, Transparent, transparencies could be achieved, uh, solid, yeah, things like that. Uh, how would you describe briefly this so-called, maybe I would call it an architectural endgame in the future? You know, uh, hopefully when technology does catch up, I mean physical technology catches up with virtual, Technologies. How would you actually describe this world where these things uh, do come together, where the virtual and physical just coalesce into one reality? You know, and in the future where you yeah. can build anything, what yeah. do you actually build? You mean if you would even call it that reality? Or <laughs> yeah. I mean, reality is just a word like printing, no? Like yeah. everyone uses it. Like <laughs> <laughs> printing, they don't mean printing. It isn't this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's there to like represent that abstract idea, of, which I think has also a lot to do from us understanding uh, it, our cognition, right? I mean, you are aware of your own body, then you are aware of your own body on the floor, and then you are aware of your own body amongst other bodies. And that's what we call reality. And then in that, we have some more significant moments of existence that we call experiences. So we, that's a reality, as in like, what I am aware of, where I am sensing. So I guess this is just the word that we're using to describe that, but eventually, if everything would combine together, it would just be just a new format. No? Mm. But, I, but I think it's interesting to point out that, of course, the terms we're using now are, they're, they're even, I think, really holding us back. Because as we said in the talk, we see, and we want to push this, this kind of way of thinking that, that a painting or anything that is representing something else is virtual. And virtual reality, VR, this term, is really becoming like a, like a, a gate or AR. No, of course, I, I do think that eventually we will stop calling it that and they will sort of start to merge. And I think one good example is um, 19th century in architecture, kind of theoretical separations from what's decorative and what's structural, the Semper Vand yeah. and Gewand. And that it was, it's even, it's so hard to imagine now, but it, there was a time when there was a radical thought to think that the surface of a building is not the building itself. 
like that the ornament can be taken off or like the, that you have a color that you can remove or you know carvings in stone or carvings in stone if you remove that then you remove the building itself and that's just the way we think now that what you see is not necessarily yeah. what the building how it's held up or and there's an ent entire modern branches of expressionist ar architecture through Kup Himmelblau or Saha indeed that you know what you see is clearly not even close to what what the building actually is structurally and we don't struggle with that we don't like you know kind of shock us so i think that certainly we will see moments when like oh yeah these things are just happening and certainly you know, there was a moment when you know we all stopped and like hang on there's screens everywhere now like when did this even happen there's a sort of you know, dream of the past like sci-fi movies from the 80s screens everywhere and it's like now there's screens everywhere and we're just like yeah and no one was like stopping to think of the moment when that actually happened it just happened and we've Consider that surfaces we look at in buildings, they could change already now within defined borders. But as you say, of course, soon that will probably change dramatically. I mean, I think that the word that you the word that you used end game is kind of an interesting one. What is the end game? <laughs> you know, of this kind of fusing of of or normalization of of yeah. technologies. Because I think that yes, you mentioned. Suddenly we look around and there's screens, of the, there's that famous photograph of the election of Pope, whoever before it was, before it was before Benedict, you know, and the, the, the kind of differentiation between the photograph of the ex people's experience in Piazza San Pietro of the event was one of just kind of black and, and then one of just screens everywhere. But I always think that even in moments in which we realize there's a certain uh, context we're existing in, we're always thinking well beyond. Uh, <laughs> Almost. <laughs> uh, we're thinking well beyond that. We're not quite satisfied by, by a current reality. And I suppose there's that, that, always that feeling that what is the next thing? What is the next step? And, but it's a very large question. Maybe it's one for a private conversation afterwards. <laughs> Does anybody have any, uh, any more questions? Yes. Oh. One second. Yep. I'm wondering if it's if you think it's necessary for virtual reality to contain the tactile experience in order to evolve and survive ultimately, or if it's enough for it to be like a shared dream that really just exists in the mind. But your your um, your visual experience contains tactile experience, right? And you're projecting the way something feels just by seeing it. The only problem would be when you don't have a reference for it, when you, what you are seeing in virtual <coughs> reality is something that you don't have the experience of touching in physical mm -hmm. reality. Then it does much confusion. confusion. Yeah. But uh, yeah, maybe, maybe someone has a <laughs> lot of experience. Well, I, <laughs> I mean, I really value touch. And there's something about um, the anxious mind that can talk really fast. As you, as you mentioned with the development of virtual reality the first time, everyone speculated so wildly and I, I often hear these conversations going on where people are like oh yeah well humans are heading towards extinction and then they're listing the reasons this is happening and I'm just sort of like guys maybe we want to like hold this as if it matters I mean it, to me it matters and thinking about younger generations and it, that that to me matters and there's something about touch and feeling something that um I for a very brief Time, I worked um, as a therapist to young boys with autism and one of the things that we did was an exercise called manding where you or it wasn't the, in the kind of therapy I was doing where you hand an object to the toddler and they hold it and then they have to relinquish it and hand it back and you just practice that again and again and again and it is interesting to me that that is effective and it is interesting to me the kinds of emotion that people have felt holding a fir cone or holding a stone or holding a leaf in the virtual reality experiences that I'm making and the tears that they've shed when I've taken the goggles off about, um, you know, it grounds that capacity we have of letting our abstract speculative mind just take off. I'm sorry. 
Shall, I, yeah, no, processing, <laughs> processing. Um, shall we have this one more question? Or did the person leave? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, didn't, I forgot who it was. Hi, um, thank you very much for the presentation and also with the panel discussion. So my question is, um, because we sort of know that in virtual reality, we can create anything. But somehow, as you mentioned, somehow people just start to create rooms and like closed space and boxes. So I think actually, maybe it's not the lack of creativity or imagination, but it's just the cognitive process that maybe we're scared and maybe we try to create something that's safe for us to be in there. So my question is, um, what do you guys think about that like cognitive mind thinking process? And also the second question is, what do you guys um, what do you guys think about the importance of how to train people to be able to express themselves and be more safe inside the virtual reality and start to create something and push the creative boundary inside it? Shall we take that second question? Because I think that's quite interesting. Do you want to begin, Ben? <clears throat> sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, the saddest moment. It's not the first time I cried in relation to virtual reality, but the saddest moment that I ever had was IBM made this advert for this game called Art Broken Sword. Um, and it was advertising IBM, what, uh, it was related to IBM Watson. And there's this anime that was produced in the 90s where all these teenagers are really into this virtual world where they all connect with their brain headsets and then their brain signals all contribute to the forming of this virtual world that they all then inhabit. And then through the thinking, oh, it'd be great if you could get the video. No, it's not this one. Uh, <laughs> it's a broken sword. IBM Watson, then you might find it. Um, and they produced this amazing video that described this. And I cannot tell you how excited I was uh, coming from being somebody who, uh, who grew up in the same virtual world. Oh my world. God. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. Being, <laughs> Go back to the yeah, images. This, this is kind of close. You're getting closer. Does everyone do this? See, this is like... And I was just like, I can quit my job tomorrow, nothing matters anymore. Um, and so, I mean, in direct response to your question, <laughs> uh, I think it's really important to train people to think creatively <laughs> about what uh, we should be making in these spaces. Otherwise, we're going to be really bored. Like, I'm really bored. Every Sunday, I download all of the different things that have been built yeah. in virtual reality, try them all, like, for 10, 20 seconds, and it's just all rubbish. No, that's <laughs> Except there's one weird one where you use your arms to, and there's, like, a different kind of gravity, and you hit your arms against the ground, and then you, like, float up, and this is how you get around the world. you like, these weird disembodied arms. This is... I mean, it's not popular. <laughs> great, a great interface to be exploited in a different context. On that note, we will no, leave on. it. I Everyone's think. Got an um, to this. Do we? We can go one. We can go one more round if you are burning. <laughs> I just think there's something about being outdoors, uh, but like virtual reality experience outdoors. This is the first part of your question. Um, maybe if we went outdoors more and spent more time on the land, that we wouldn't just invent the uh, the room that we're on the computer in. There's like just a recursive activity going on there. So at the moment, I'm just making virtual reality for outdoor spaces. It has its challenges. <laughs> and there's like, you know, when you talk about the end game, I kind of think that's like indicative of the like over anxious Western mind and it's like apocalyptic obsessions um there's a cyclical time in nature the time of the moon and the, you know that we we exist in a um an, a, a structure that if we maybe that would be a good thing to orientate ourselves with <laughs> yes now you can I... about burning man <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, like, sim as a simple extension, you know, I realized I, w 
I was at Burning Man, which is a festival, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things which I realized was that I'd never oriented my day by sunrise or sunset before. Right? There are things that happen in the background and they're annoying because it's light or it's dark and you're like, oh. But <laughs> when you orientate your, your life by sunrise and sunset, you have this connection, which I agree is, is extremely profound. Um, do you have anything to add or shall we wrap it up there? We'll wrap it up there. And then Amy will be able to confirm this, but I believe that the installation is open until... 9.30. Yeah, we might have to go, yeah, we'll just double check um, that, yeah, I think we're open, we have the VR headset still uh, running until 9.30. Um, obviously, I don't think we can um, fit everyone in um, in half an hour, but um, if you'd like to make your way out, we can do first come, first serve Um Also, on the first floor, we've still got the bar um, and nibbles, um, but I'd also like to say, uh, on behalf of Stoke, um, thank you so much to our panel, um, and James, for your chair, your work in charity. Thank you. Uh, leading the discussion.